obviously the, the more recent situation that we're all in, and this can help provide some guidance and some steps, some tangible steps to, to move towards a better economic future. Um, so that, that's about all I have to say, and we look forward to um, both past, existing, and future partnerships to that end. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for your, your help throughout all this. So as a group, collectively, we worked through developing a scope of work, and we contracted with Forward Planning, an economic development consultant who you'll hear from in just a second, because I see Todd's on now. Um, and so, but before we, we hear from Todd, I wanted to stress just a couple of things. First is, we were more than halfway through this process when we experienced COVID-19 and the resulting business shutdowns. And subsequently, the general economic impact that we're all gonna be experiencing long into the future because of this pandemic. So as you, and as you can imagine, that required a little bit of an adjustment in the direction we were going. And you'll hear more about that during, during Todd and Sean's presentation. But secondly, I wanted to point out the benefits that have resulted from these three municipalities working together. Micro-regional partnerships like this are vitally important as smaller municipalities struggle financially. The more that local governments can find ways to share resources and partner, the better they can serve their respective constituencies. So we hope that this partnership on this particular project sort of paves the way for broader discussions on ways the three municipalities and others in the area can, can work together in the future. Lastly, as part of this overall process, leadership from the three municipalities have committed to working together to implement the strategies that will come out of this report. And we at the Second Century Alliance are excited to help facilitate that collective effort, all in the interest of creating jobs and economic opportunity for Coatesville area residents. So um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Before we get started, the presentation is being recorded. And in a second, we're gonna go live for Todd's presentation on Facebook. Um, and it will be available for um, future viewing on the city's YouTube channel. So, and during the, um, during the presentation, we invite your comments. You can add them in the chat box if you're watching on Zoom or live on the Facebook page. And we'll do our best to, to curate those and answer those questions as we go along or toward the end of the program. Um, but if we don't get to all of them, we'll be sure to address any unanswered questions um, in, in the coming days. So now I'm going to try and pass the screen and microphone over to Todd, and uh, we'll see if we can get that working. So Todd, you can share your screen. I can, and uh, I think you're about to say, can you hear me okay? We, we can hear you, but your volume's super low. Is it really? Still the same? Still, still low? Sunny can hear me? Barely. I'm sorry. Um, do you have a calling number that I can use? For the, uh, yes, I, I will send it to you. Okay. Or if you can keep it, all right. Um, actually, Check the email that you received this afternoon. It should be in there. I cannot minimize my screen. All right, I have a meeting ID number. Is that the same as the telephone number? No. Uh, <clears throat> there's no number that I can tell it's in that screenshot. Maybe I can take a look here very quickly. <clears throat> uh, I just forwarded it to you. Thank you. Sean. Yep. Yeah, when the when the video is recording, I can't I can't minimize the screen. Yeah, the one that I got earlier didn't have these numbers. Sorry. Okay. I am dialing in now.
Okay, if you want to tell me what number you're calling in from, I can unmute you. I just don't have your name on here. Last, just the last four digits, Todd. Sonny? I can hear you now. Uh, his, the last four numbers, uh, his num phone number is 5001. 5001? No, that's not the no. number? <laughs> okay. I was trying. <laughs> I think he's at 5602. Uh, okay. I don't have that number. All right. Todd, let me hear you. I'm here. All right. There we mm -hmm. go. Now we need your screen, and we're good to go. Okay. All right. Uh, can you tell me if you can see the screen? Can you guys see the screen? Nope, not yet. All right. I think I've got to share it on my end. Let's see. Uh, how about now? It says that you're starting to share your screen. There we go. All right, we are up and running. Uh, again, apologies for the delays. Thank you everyone for your patience. Todd, we'll hand it over to you. All right, super. Thank you everyone. And again, I apologize as well. Um, forward planning, we are Lanny's economists. We do market and economic analysis for a variety of public and private sector clients uh, nationally and regionally. And we were hired as a prime a consulting firm to work on this project. Uh, we are joined by Sean Garrigan of SGA Associate, Associates to help us with uh, the planning aspects, uh, planning and zoning aspects of this assignment. So Sean will be piping in at various points during this presentation. We are, I don't know, somewhere close to uh, 12 months into this assignment and obviously some of those months um, were you know, added as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so what should have been probably something on the order of seven to eight months turned into what is now, you know, approximately 12 months. Nonetheless, we've done quite a bit of work um, leading up to tonight. Uh, what we are showing you tonight, and for those who've been at previous presentations, is not a, uh, a redo or a kind of a, a you know, rerun of what we presented uh, previously with regard to uh, market analysis findings and some of the existing conditions that Sean spoke about. This is really saying that the culmination of the analysis that has been performed to date, um, we're really focused on, okay, what are the opportunities as well as, you know, some of the challenges to, uh, to achieve uh, economic success for the three different communities and really we're going to uh, touch upon each one of the communities, what their opportunities are. But in general, we'd like to think that because this is a multi-municipal economic strategic plan, that each of the communities will benefit um, from what the other communities do in terms of uh, bringing in uh, new consumers, creating uh, job opportunities, and, and obviously uh, creating new real estate value. All, all those things combined should have a global effect on the three municipalities. So without further ado, um, this is our, uh, on the screen now, project process, the background, and really, um, you know, looking at on the bottom of the screen, these are the activities. We're obviously in this final box on the right-hand lower column of the uh, page, um, strategic development sites, draft economic development site plans, financial feasibility, financial, uh, final economic development site plans. A uh, quick note here, we did not complete the financial feasibility analysis, and that was principally due to the fact of the pandemic. What ordinarily would happen is we would, um, some of the redevelopment opportunities that we identify, we would model them out over time. The problem is, is that with 
uh, COVID-19 has disrupted uh, normal economic um, systems such that it's hard to project out in the future uh, what lease rates might look like, what construction costs might be, and a variety of other metrics that we'd ordinarily use when we're financially modeling. So that particular element uh, dropped out of this study, but everything else remains. Very quickly, uh, study takeaways, um, and I'm not going to expect you to read this, or am I going to read it to you, but this is just an overview that is in the report. We have this for each of the three communities. And as Sean will actually kind of lead us through our target areas, um, what we've identified are distinct target areas within each of the three communities that are basically their, their focus uh, points on where we think, uh, you know, private investment or a combination of private and public investment can take place. In some cases, these are just improvements to the infrastructure or the urban design. In other cases, they are um, investments that would create job opportunities and or improve building stocks such that people are going to come and, and either you know, live or spend money in the local area. And we also have elements that really speak to recreation and um, uh, public open space improvements as well. We'll get into those shortly. As you mentioned, we have this for all three communities, so we're showing you Valley Township here in the top screen. We'll zero in on this very shortly. And then on the bottom, South Coatesville Borough, um, which has target area six. Um, you might be wondering why, and I'll get back here, you've got more target areas in Coatesville, um, you know, in this case, four versus one each in Valley and in South Coatesville. And that's just simply by virtue of kind of our our general study area, as well as, you know, when we identified where the development, redevelopment opportunities are, um, they were simply, you know, uh, based on developable real estate where infrastructure um, exists and where we thought there would be a market receptive opportunity. It so happens that in the city of Coatesville, there are a number of those types of locations in and around the central business district. Um, when we're thinking about Valley Township and in South um, Coatesville, uh, those are more uh, targeted or more limited, and so thus you have um, just the one opportunity or the you know the one target area in uh, each of those communities. Part of our assignment was um, not only identifying target areas uh, or focus areas for redevelopment or investment, but also target businesses. So. Um, and we did that for each of the three communities. Uh, in this particular case, uh, what you have on your screen, targeted business opportunities, and really this is um, not just for business, but in the case of Coatesville and to a lesser extent, Valley Township, they're residential opportunities. Uh, those are, of you who are familiar, you've got a, a train station, um, or a new train station that will be coming online in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. Uh, reinstating SEPTA service, that is obviously a catalytic event. And I think all parties concerned, and certainly we on the consulting team felt that um, that is a game changer. And it's particularly a game changer to the extent that multifamily, high density multifamily residential development can occur around that train station. And why is that important? And it's particularly important now with the, the pandemic and what it's going to look like after uh, you know things get back to some type of normalcy, is that coming out of a recession, um, housing development usually, usually leads the way uh, in terms of bringing in new households who have purchasing power, and you know that in turn creates demand for you know local goods and services, which in turn brings in workers, which you know, further stimulates demand for housing and so forth, and then you start to build on that. So um, this is also a strategy that has been successfully implemented in many other communities, certainly throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country. That is transit-oriented development or uh, development that is near a transit center or a station. And so uh, Coatesville, in this sense, has that opportunity. Beyond that, um, you know, you know, in addition to attracting developers who are experienced in doing that, uh, you know, the types of businesses that will certainly, you know, fare best early on, you know, post-pandemic 
uh, personal service businesses, uh, barbershops, salons, as you can see on the screen, uh, you know, eateries such as, uh, you know, pizza restaurants, uh, diners, Chinese restaurants, that kind of thing, um, and other personal service type businesses. We also think that a catalytic type of um, operation would be a food incubator commercial kitchen, which we've heard, uh, you know, some interest for in this local area, which is also a uh, opportunity for local entrepreneurs to, you know, try out a business, um, you know, uh, plan and then ultimately migrate into a empty storefront with that particular restaurant. With that, uh, Sean, you want to jump in for me uh, on this and I'll kind of work the slides for you. Okay. Um, so taking the information that Todd uh, determined in terms of opportunities, we looked at the physical conditions on the ground and, and as a transit oriented development area, obviously access to the primary uh, and secondary transit service is important. Um, the impetus being the investment in the rail station. Um, so the quarter mile radius represents a, the typical kind of capture area for TOD development in terms of walkability and proximity to the station itself. Looking at the conditions on the ground, some of the other things that are being contemplated, we identified um, this, um, this area that's close to the station that's um, off of uh, Chestnut Street as an op just one example of a block where you have a mix of opportunity potentially for infill, whether that's you know, various densities, as Todd mentioned, up to multifamily, uh, as well as adaptive <laughs> reuse, and then also certainly the ability to do uh, housing rehabilitation, which is one of the things that we heard back um, in our meetings. So, um, yeah some pictures of some of the conditions. It kind of illustrates um, the character, some of the things that are you know, underway, uh, as well as the connective tissue, as we call it. I mean, I think one of the things is we're working for the public sector in the sense that there's each of these municipalities, you can, there are certain things you can do to drive development, um, but really what, what municipalities do, especially is they either um, regulate through policy, referencing the zoning uh, item that Todd mentioned is one of the things that we considered, but also infrastructure. Um, so um, Coatesville has been investing in streetscape work um, from the train station, specifically up on Third Avenue. Um, we, we recommended some other places, specifically Fleetwood Street and uh, the surrounding context to kind of continue that work, because if you're going to promote transit-oriented development. Part of that is, you know, investing in the pedestrian realm and the connect connectivity piece that links the development to the transit service itself. Um, as we mentioned, promotion of TOD or transit-oriented development opportunities. Uh, with housing is going to be critical um, and, and kind of a catalytic type of investment opportunity. I'm not going to read through the rationale or responsible actors. This you will find in the report and um, we've done this for each of the actions that we're recommending so that it's not just to say you should do this, we're providing you with the reasons why and also identifying to the extent possible uh, those actors, you know, organizations, whether it's the city, the, the township, uh, other public sector entities um, that should also be involved. Sean mentioned uh, continued complete street upgrades within the TOD area. Sean, I don't know if you want to say anything more about complete streets. Um, so I think the concept, which again, um, Coatesville is promoting is investing in sidewalks, the thinking about the whole street, not just the the vehicular piece of it, but the pedestrian bicycle friendly aspect of it, which becomes not only a utility in the sense that it helps you get from point A to point B, but investing in the public realm also makes the whole neighborhood more attractive, which then reinforces private reinvestment behind the sidewalk line. Um, so, you know, there's already 
a willingness and an infrastructure in place to continue that as you know budgets and fund matching funding sources either state or federal are available which you know we don't anticipate right now um changing um, and then one thing you'll see kind of connected to uh, several areas is looking at the potential of the greenway um, along Brandywine Creek. Um, you know, if you get go down towards First Avenue, the intersection of First Avenue and Lincoln Highway is a pretty busy intersection. That's um, sort of your connection over to the the greenway, the park, et cetera, et cetera, as all that expands, one of the ideas that we have that we show in the plan is, is there a possibility of creating basically a bicycle flyover uh, that would connect uh, not only the core of downtown Coatesville over to the recreation amenities, but conversely, when we talk about the flats area, thinking about if there was a more direct connection that would have, that would make that area, in fact, TOD, accessible to rail transit which we believe would greatly you know increase the value of it from the perspective of a developer and we do go through in addition in the report to identifying um, who, who can take the lead or who are likely partners but also the other agencies and funding sources that are you know commonly used to tap into those So these are other existing conditions uh, in the central business district of Coatesville. Um, you know, I'm sure those of you who are familiar with Coatesville, these are familiar images. Uh, and then, I don't know, Sean, you want to talk about what we have here? Yeah, so tied to the initiatives underway focused on attracting more retail, um, we looked at opportunities within the uses that Todd identified as having opportunity with the idea of both housing and food. Uh, and this is definitely a, a key location, both for its frontage um, on Lincoln Highway as essentially the main street through, through the city, but also just the fact that it's a, a fair amount of open undeveloped land. So we illustrated how you could potentially do what we call sort of horizontal mixed use, which achieves the type of activity that creates vibrancy in a downtown, but with less complexity in the sense that you have multifamily sort of tucked behind some public urban public space. And then you have a market food accelerator, which could be, you know, restaurants, um, a, a bunch of different things, but it's organized in an urban format, but yet has the amenities um, that um, you know, folks would want, especially from the standpoint of uh, the residential piece. I mean, this is a very kind of practical uh, way that this might be able to be developed, and it would become a, a significant anchor um, in the downtown. Yeah, it should also be noted that this is only you know less than a five-minute walk from the train station, so this could also be a draw for commuters, uh, either you know getting ready to get on the train or before they got on the train or coming home um, from work, uh, that it would be relatively close by to where the train station is and where the projected or where the uh, proposed garage would be as well. Um, so target area two recommendations uh, promote mixed use development with a food-based anchor. Uh, this is at the Key Lincoln Highway corner. Obviously, um, you know, this is another you know proposed catalytic type project you know if this would get going it would certainly help stimulate foot traffic which would then have positive influence on nearby uh, or adjacent buildings and uh, you know help to you know create demand for those buildings and, and bring new retail into those slots like we do for the other recommendations we pro provide the rationale as well as the responsible actors Target area three, Sean. So um, we we honed in on this this site more not well to il illustrate I think an opportunity from an economic development standpoint of how to move things along and show uh, opportunity without an, an enormous amount of investment. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about this site, so I think what we're 
proposing is more illustrative of actually things that could happen in multiple sites, including the site we just looked at as an interim use, which is really how can you start to do some things that create activity, again, reinforce vibrancy, establish the potential market that exists without um, in millions of dollars in investment. So, you know, this site is obviously at a very prominent location. It, I mean, it's very aptly named because it is a gateway uh, and it's sort of um, the center of the center. Um, and so we, we just, we honed in on it as just an example of how it might be able to be programmed um, for a bunch of different things. And I think what we show here could also be, you know, applied to smaller parking lots, vacant lots, et cetera which is, um, again, until very recent events, although I think people are getting creative and looking at the fact that these are not very permanent spaces sometimes, you can readjust them without a lot of disruption and accommodate social distancing, for example. But you know, basically looking at things that are, for lack of a better way to describe it, pop-up uses where it's recreation, it's entertainment, it's seasonal, uh, and it's flexible. So things like outdoor beer gardens, uh, event spaces, um, ice skating rinks that you can put up in the winter. So you're starting to think about 12 month of the year activity. Um, these things can be very permanent or they can in fact be beta test uses to see how they go without an enormous amount of investment more as temporary facilities. Um, and then, you know, if they're very popular, maybe then you pursue integrating them as permanent facilities here or other places within the quote marketplace of either recreation or entertainment. So uh, this site also illustrates a condition that is the case on several of the sites that we are looking at, which is we know that these sites have, or some of these sites have industrial pasts, they may have environmental conditions. Um, that shouldn't deter looking at ways to move ahead and reuse them. They're, you know, Pennsylvania is one of the best states in the country to repurposing brownfield sites. It's something that we as a firm specialize in. And you know, just from what we've been able to ascertain about all the sites we looked at, there doesn't appear to be hurdles that are not um, able to be overcome. And in fact, there are resources financially in terms of grants and things that could actually become a source of funding to help implement some of these things. So there's, we identify in the plan different partners and resources, et cetera, et cetera, that could be available to the municipalities to implement them. And then I think, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of things going on that are resources and partners to tap into, including some of the things that are happening um, regionally within the recreation space in terms of looking at new opportunities to improve, expand, uh, diversify recreation opportunities. So, you know, part of the lesson I think of the work that we've done by looking at very different sites with different programs is part of the way to move a lot of different things ahead at the same time without competing with each other is to do different things and tap into different resources and capacity. So you, you have a lot of resources here in Chester County available to um, all three communities to try to advance these things. So these are just you know, examples, mostly regionally, uh, at least the two bottom ones are obviously Philadelphia examples of the types of things that are not major investments that create um, places that people just wanna hang out. And I think what we've learned through recent events is the actual true social value of open space. Um, and I think I'm actually a bit optimistic that more funding is gonna be coming for these types of spaces, not less. Yeah, I agree. I mean, without knowing how long we're gonna be in a social distancing protocol, um, it is quite likely that there will be resources made available to create opportunities like these because we could be in this for you know another year or two at, at least all right our next target area uh the flats and um sean you want to give some overview on this um so again this is an area that um is has an industrial legacy it actually includes land in both the city and the township 
Um, the expansion of the trail up into the valley represents an opportunity of what's really possible. And there's been other studies done in terms of the trail potential of expanding that regionally, um, which makes this site attractive. There is a pretty substantial railroad viaduct that's quite active that does pass through the site, but there's plenty of land available to do things. And we know there's been some pretty significant uh, ideas presented that might happen here, um, kind of operating independently of that, we looked at what might be possible, at least in a portion, uh, without that sort of exceptional kind of use um, that takes advantage of some of the attributes um, that exist. I'm gonna go to the next slide, Todd. So um, this is approximately the area we're looking at. Um, obviously the frontage um, piece and then this portion of the back, which actually extends um, into the township. We, we kind of focused on the back portion as an illustration of, of what might be possible there tapping into a different sector of the opportunity, um, which Todd will talk about in a second. This is kind of that connective line of what is possible if you built a, a, a trail, multi-use trail bridge over First Avenue connected to the park on the east side and then to the train station. I mean, suddenly a very long walk becomes a relatively short walk. Plus I think it would really can really bring people into the park and make the park more of a neighborhood mm -hmm. asset um, for the established neighborhood. Next slide. So, um, Todd, do you just want to talk a little bit about the residential sort of program and then I'll talk about how we laid this out? Yeah. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, and, and understand that we don't just say, hey, this would be nice to have here. Part of this falls out of the market study um, that we've conducted. Actually, um, when we do the market study, it's not just about looking at numbers on a sheet of paper or um, analyzing uh, trends, but we're also uh, performing what we refer to as qualitative analysis, where we are interviewing uh, real estate uh, brokers as well as developers. And it just so happens that, um, you know, there you know, are at least uh, some developers who are already interested in this concept of developing, whether it's age restricted or um, just smaller, even starter home type um, residential units in this local area. And so what you see here in terms of this design, think of um, these could be bungalow style um, housing units that are clustered in, in groups of four or six. Um, they are you know, relatively small, relatively small, meaning, you know, not larger than 1,500 square feet generally, uh, principally two bedroom units, perhaps there are some three bedrooms, but mostly two bedroom type units. And again, these could be designed as starter homes, which we know there is just a dearth of for first time buyers, or they could be uh, designed for uh, empty nesters who are looking to downsize from the local area, which we heard through our interviews and our research that there just isn't enough of that housing stock locally. So, you know, this could be um, very well received by the marketplace in that it is only, you know, what, what could be a five to 10 minute walk to the new SEPTA train station would make it all that more attractive. Sean? Yeah, I mean, so we just illustrated how you could basically lay out one story units as um, like either senior flats or um, you know, kind of clustered around open space, rear access, uh, garages still connected to the units. Just to illustrate, you know, what might be possible in this area and taps into the kind of adding a different residential product into the marketplace based on, you know, Todd's findings. Right, so we're saying promote 55 plus. I mean, quite honestly, this could be 55 plus, or again, it could be starter homes. We did hear um, through some of our interviews that there really does need to be uh, more housing that is a you know quality stock, but also affordable at the entry level for young professionals or young folks who want to stay in the area, or you know young people who 
let's say, uh, would like to move to Coatesville. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about this, whether it's 55 and older or, you know, young professionals, that's also a very rich pool of potential entrepreneurs. Um, the fasting, fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the country and has been for the last 10 to 15 years have been people who are 50 years of age and older. So, you know, we want to try and, and you know, uh, maintain and, and or retain uh, the number of those folks, particularly who, you know, have the wherewithal and, and equity that, you know, can be put into uh, productive private use in the local area. All right, Valley Township, um, we are moving on to, uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we are going through a sea change with regard to uh, retail and office space, and really even before the pandemic, um, we were already seeing a significant <clears throat> change and upheaval really uh, in brick and mortar retail and certainly commercial office space. That has not changed. Excuse me one second. <coughs> and no, it is not COVID, um, I hope. In any event, um, we, uh, what we see uh, is not you know, additional retail or office space being developed, but what is already, I think, proven itself, uh, proven itself successful here and that is light industrial flex space, which is, you know, prominent in um, Valley Township. And so what we're saying is that they should build upon that success. Um, I believe based on the research that I've conducted, you're going to see a increase in demand for that kind of space as uh, there's been a call for more supply chain to be uh, supply chain uh, businesses to be brought back from overseas and located locally um, and that also the you know last mile service for these you know major um, you know uh, e-commerce companies such as Amazon and Walmart they want to be relatively close to their customer base so another reason why we would anticipate an increase in demand uh, for the kind of space that currently exists in Valley Township, and in fact, they have room to develop more uh, within the two light industrial parks that they have, their airport industrial and the Highlands Corporate uh, Center Park. Target area five, and so, Sean? So we um, looked at, in, in, in the case of all the communities, um, we looked at, you know, black, back, black, the uh, background context documents, comprehensive plans, the county comprehensive plan, looked at zoning ordinances, et cetera. And um, you know, this, this piece of land here um, jumped out at us because it's actually owned by the airport authority. Um, it's zoned for planned development and it's adjacent to the area on the opposite side of Lincoln Highway that um, has been identified through previous planning efforts and is evolving in the township as a kind of suburban uh, community town center for lack of a better way to describe it. So we looked at this as an opportunity. You have a lot to work from. Um, you know, how much the airport is really an amenity is, it, it almost doesn't matter uh, in the sense that it's more just the proximity of the land to everything else that's going on. I mean, it can't hurt, um, but it's certainly, yeah. It yeah. Sean, Sean, I'm going to interject. It could be understood for those who are not familiar with that airport. It really is a recreational leisure airport as opposed to a airport that is uh, providing commerce. Um, there is some commerce that takes place there, but it is relatively minimal uh, when compared to how many people are using that airport just for recreational purposes. So the image on the right, um, which is from one of the earlier documents that was prepared for the township, um, you can see there's sort of an, an orange-ish building at a diagonal. That's the new municipal building. And then the land that we're talking about is just below that on that drawing, um, showing the relationship of things that are planned, things that exist, and how you might be able to tie in these amenities uh, to create basically a business park on this property. So if you want to go to the next slide. So, 
so um, we worked from Todd, the program that Todd recommended, trying to identify opportunities where land is in, in essence ready to go, and this, this land would meet that uh, characteristic. Uh, I think the key thing is we would like, or what we're recommending is you think about some of the other amenities to kind of make everything cohesive on both sides of Lincoln Highway so you get a bit more value out of it and it makes the area more attractive for development depending on the exact use of a particular end user. Um, but you, in essence, work within the planned development zone to, you know, build that out like an office um, kind of uh, suburban corporate center. Right, and it should be understood too that the opportunities uh, in in those locations, it's a combination of uh, light manufacturing assembly, there could be some technology firms that would locate there, small, uh, as well as, um, you know, some small back office operations. I think you've got a smattering of all of those things that currently exist it should also be understood that these particular um, business parks have great appeal to um, business owners who live within a 20 to 30 minute drive of these locations. I mean, quite honestly, most of the, the businesses that are located there are owned by people that live in the county or certainly within, you know, a 45 minute drive time of these locations. And that's that's fairly typical of uh, business parks like these. You, you're generally not going to find national companies, you know, locating a space uh, in a small office park or a small business park environment like, uh, you know, like what you have here. And instead, these are um, operated by people who are relatively um, local to the area and certainly familiar with what the region has to offer. So, <clears throat> part of the recommendations that we have for this is also to hold kind of an invest in day, you know, there'd be an invest in uh, Valley Township day where they would highlight uh, what they have to offer. And obviously they'd be marketing it to the local region because that is more than likely where you're gonna be pulling that type of investment. All right, finally, South Coatesville targeted businesses and areas. <clears throat> um, actually, I think I, I, I jumped ahead. Let me just see if I did jump ahead. Oops. Yeah, well, I'll start, let me, let me go back here. Um, these are images, uh, precedent images, uh, which I think are out of order, out of sequence. Nonetheless, we're gonna speak to them. Um, Sean, you wanna, well, you, you can hit the top two and I'll hit the bottom two. So, you know, with South Coatesville, what we tried to do was look at some unique opportunities that takes advantage of some of the larger open undeveloped properties as part of the primarily the Arcelor complex that might be open for different types of uses that start to generate economic opportunity. Um, so we, we made some recommendations based on some other things that we've worked on in terms of similar context and similar types of sites in terms of brownfields actually post uh, steel uh, facilities. So, you know, one, and, and these are meant to be illustrative of possibilities. So it, it, they're not like hard and true in the sense that it has to be a BMX uh, motocross facility, but we honed in on this one because of the nature of the opportunity that that represents, which may not initially be apparent. And, and what we found is these types of recreation uses become pretty significant regional destinations if the facilities are built to a particular standard and there is a group, um, specifically in the case of like the BMX tracks in the United States that goes around and builds these facilities in partnership with municipalities and parks um, authorities, et cetera. And they bring in a lot of people um, they serve the local population, they serve a larger population, these are people who come for a weekend, um, they will stay in hotels, they will eat, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And but at the same time, they don't require, again, an enormous amount of investment in infrastructure to create. And they may not be permanent either, they may be something that is successful, and it does grow and it does um, stay for a long time, or 
it's something that illustrates what's possible. Other things sort of orbit around it, and then over time, it evolves into something else. Um, you want to talk about the other two, Todd? Yeah. Um, and for it, just jumping into the, the other two, <clears throat> you know, the, Sean mentioned something about uh, attracting, you know, patrons that come from outside the area and will spend money. Keep in mind, too, this is a type of, the type of um, activity, um, it's almost similar to a NASCAR type of event where people come in for a weekend. This is usually not a one-day event. It will usually be a two- or three-day event over a weekend. And, of course, they need lodging. And when I talked earlier about how, you know, the three municipalities can benefit each other, this is an example of that. This is an example of, let's say, if you had the BMX, uh, you know, track in South Coatesville, while South Coatesville does not have a lodging facility, um, Valley Township and or perhaps, you know, at some future date, City of uh, Coatesville would have that lodging facility, so they too would benefit even though they would not have the physical infrastructure of the track in place. The uh, bottom left image is of a hydroponic farming facility. For those not familiar, hydroponic farming is typically done on an indoor uh, basis. It can be done within containers, which is very popular now. It can be done in, inside of greenhouses. It uh, uses, uses minimal amount of water that's typically recirculated, so it's highly sustainable, very green in the, in the truest sense. Um, and it is something that generally also requires a little bit of space to do. When I say a little bit of space, in other words, you know, while you can do it in um, crowded urban areas, and it is being done, you know, to the extent that you can get larger footprints of land on which to do it, you gain economies of scale and can really create a, a nice little business model, which by the way, um, is also very, um, you know, entrepreneurial friendly or certainly friendly to startup type uh, operations. So we think that has some, we have some traction in the local area. We were also recommending that you could create this hydroponic uh, farming uh, business and co-locate it with, let's say, an outside cafe or restaurant that served obviously the produce produced, you know, and maybe has some, um, you know, outdoor ovens for, you know, uh, brick oven fired pizzas or something along those lines. So again, it's another opportunity, which quite honestly could also be co-located uh, with one of these other activities on the very bottom right hand, uh, you've got an image of a drive-in movie theater. Um, even before COVID, uh, drive-in theaters, which by the way, if you didn't know, there are approximately 22 of currently in the Commonwealth spread out, um, nothing nearby as far as we could tell. But uh, this is yet another opportunity, as I was about to say, even before COVID, um, they were kind of coming back as a bit of nostalgia. And as a result of the pandemic and obviously movie theaters being closed and or at least you know, I'm going to operate at very minimal capacity. Um, these have uh, these uh, types of theaters have you know gotten a spike in popularity, and again, it's likely to be the case for the next several years, if not beyond. You do need you know two, three acres of land at minimum to um, uh, host one of these facilities, and again, the South Coastville area that we're talking about has that opportunity. Uh, this is just kind of a rehash talking about outdoor BMX, the hydroponic farming, and the drive-in movie theater. And um, you know, we, we provide some narrative as to why um, we believe that they would uh, be market receptive. Again, this is all within the report. And now we're going to actually show you what should have come first, <laughs> but here it is. John? Yeah, so we picked... Um, this site, just as an example, there are actually quite, there's at least a few sites um, that have been raised to the process of, you know, could something happen here, could something happen there. Um, we understand that the relationship of Arcelor and their willingness to participate in, in any of this is, is an important component. Um, so we looked at this as just one example of how you might be able to repurpose a property like this for one of these uses uh, and how that um, you know, might fit and, and the scale of it. So 
you know, we've heard, you know, some concerns about access and, and traffic related to the plant and so forth and so on. And we have some recommendations in there in transportation. And those are legitimate, you know, questions related to, you know, where you might place these things if in fact you get 3,000 people showing up uh, on a weekend. Um, so that is definitely a consideration. But, you know, this, you know, shows how you can take one of their standard tracks and place it on a site like this. Um, not a major investment, but could be a major um, attraction and tied into the project we actually worked on um, that led to one of these projects in Oklahoma. They, they wanted indoor and outdoor facilities. So we show like if parts of this plant led to the decommissioning of one of these industrial buildings and they're fairly open span space um, as steel buildings usually are with flying cranes and things that you know, create pretty wide open spaces, you could end up with a year round facility um, some of these buildings uh, could be repurposed for the hydroponic farming piece. Um, and these are actually uses that work pretty well on brownfield sites. Um, so they're, depending obviously on the conditions, there are ways to make that work. So I think it, really the conclusion that we came to was certain destination oriented uses like these types of recreation uses, people will seek them out because South Coatesville has some challenges to get to in terms of it's not the center of the city of Coatesville, it's not on a main highway, but it does have land and it has other types of opportunities if you can merge the two together. Um, and so that's why we really were recommending these as opportunities to um, you know, take advantage of those attributes. And then as Todd mentioned, it really the two things can feed off of each other. If people are coming in for these recreation facilities and spending a weekend, they're going to want to do other things. They're going to stay other. They're going to need to stay somewhere. They're going to need to eat, et cetera, et cetera. Some of that can happen uh, in South Coatesville. Some of that, um, you know, maybe happens in the other two municipalities. So, you know, again, there are a lot of resources out there for environmental can to address the environmental conditions, um, and we talk about those. Um, actually, this report could serve as a basis of pursuing some of the funding to figure some of that out and actually study in more detail the feasibility of, of some of the things that we're proposing. So um, the environmental is an issue, but it isn't necessarily, necessarily a hurdle that can't be overcome. And then um, the other piece is we went through the previous planning documents um, and um, First Avenue has been identified as an important gateway. It's really a multimodal transportation um, opportunity. It needs improvement, um, which would serve, frankly, any use, uh, including the existing residents in terms of safety and more amenities would make some of the, the buildings along it today um, more desirable for improvement and repurposing. And there's resources out there to potentially do that. And it is tied to the recommendations of the mill trail study, which was recently done, that again, emphasized this idea of multimodal connectivity, which I believe would help all of the communities because they all, all of the communities involved in this project tap into this potentially shared resource. And so with that, uh, that was a kind of a high level overview of our recommendations. And um, Sunny, do you want to go ahead and start the fielding of questions? You're, Sunny, you're on mute. Happens all the time. Um, okay, so I checked Facebook and we don't have, we have, um, we had nine viewers on Facebook, but no comments. Um, Kevin, I, well, first I want to say thank you to Kevin Myers and the Chester County Planning Commission, but Kevin notes that the city of Coatesville has been awarded a county vision partnership program grant, just like this one, to undertake the zoning amendments, some of which will be likely related to as a follow-up for this economic development study. So he says potential refinements to existing overlay districts to facilitate transit-oriented development are one likely outcome of the forthcoming zoning amendments. 
Um, Chris Diello says that he read today there's a pop-up drive-in plan mm -hmm. for Oaks. So that's close by, but that's a pop-up. Um, and, and that's, oh, Chris sent a, a link to that article. And okay. that, that's it, no questions. Sonny, not to butt in, but just for notice, might be helpful just to tell people where we're at. We're, we're kind of nearing the, the wrap up of the study. And, and I think as Todd indicated, this is primarily the recommendation portion of it. There's a full report that contains the market reports and all the other background and related information that will obviously be as part um, of, of the full report that will be made available. And after this meeting, the next step essentially is to incorporate any follow-up questions or materials and all of the municipalities will then accept it. This is a study, so it's not an adoptable or adopted document, um, but it'll just be merely uh, accepted by the governing body of each individual municipality as a, a study to, again, um, move forward in, in the future as we indicated earlier. Yeah, Correct. two two popped up here. Uh, actually, a couple more while while you were talking, Kevin. Um, Chris Edwards asked on Facebook, "Will the slides be made available to the public? Can we make the PowerPoint available?" Todd. Yeah, not a problem. I'll uh, I can just pass it on to you, Sonny, and you can okay. post it as you use. Sure, we'll be able to share that. Um, Victor asks, "What are the plans for the weed and rock garden on First Avenue?" Um, I can say, and, and I think Mike, Mike Trio and James Logan are on the call and maybe they might be able to answer this, but there are plans for, um, for streetscape improvements from First Avenue to Third Avenue. So we might, you know, that might answer that question for you, Victor. I don't know if Mike is listening or if James wants to chime yeah. in. Yeah, I did hear that. Yeah, there are, we do have the continuation of the streetscape work that we intend to uh, follow through on a, on that grant with uh, it's a TIIF grant. It'll be between First Avenue and Fourth Avenue, new streetscape, new sidewalks, new amenities. Very similar to what they've shown already in their pictures for Third and Fourth Avenue, which are currently been installed. So we'll follow that whole theme throughout the city. Great. Okay, um, Dennis uh, Crook says, Westchester University Center for GIS and Spatial Analysis and Geography and Planning Department, East Fallowfield Township Analysis of Retail Market Potential, June 18th, 2019, includes the Coatesville area. That must have been one of the um, studies that, that we neglected to include in um, so Dennis, if you can get that to me, shows by credit card averages of buying over at, over going out of the area. So retail leakage, it looks like a retail leakage report and shows market money losing from the area. So that's what that looks like. Um, Dennis, if you can get that to me, we can um, we can adopt that and kind of add that into the to the context. And Tool says high quality parks and recreation can play a pivotal role in attracting and retaining businesses. I'd love to see you underscore the importance of this in your uh, report beyond destination recreation. Um, the Dantzler Agreed. family has any consideration to parking needs to support the business growth. Um, there are um, efforts underway to craft a citywide um, parking strategy. So we're looking at residential, we're looking at downtown, we're looking at meters and parking structures, but that's, I can only speak to that uh, about the city. Um, and maybe Todd and, and Sean can talk to the parking uh, for the other, for the other two municipalities. Well, um, this is Sean. I think from the standpoint of <laughs> the other two municipalities in terms of zoning, um, and likely where the opportunities are, you're following the ordinance um, with a traditional kind of off street parking strategy. Obviously, when you talk about transit oriented development in, in the core of the city, that's a different sort of paradigm because ideally you want to get people out of the car uh, and using transit, which is also part of the attractiveness of the area. So um, I, I think it, from the perspective of some of the things we showed, we showed how you balance or considered how you balance a 
providing a certain amount of off street parking, especially for residential um, to make that attractive and competitive without overburdening your development where you start driving everything by off street parking. But ideally, um, you know, you can do some strategic parking to support your retail, but you have a lot of um, on street parking and then you know, parking is a tough one because you almost uh, you want a parking problem in the sense that you want people going there and parking, but you want parking to be convenient. I mean, I, I have a bit of a philosophy you need for retail and Todd, you might totally disagree with this, but you, um, having lived in a lot of, uh, in two small boroughs uh, with, you know, a little downtown, um, you have to have the potential to be able to park near the front door of a business, but then you keep like looping around and as long as you can walk there, but it's this idea that you have the possibility of having relatively convenient parking. It's always, yeah. it's always a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I think most parking, most parking consultants, and we work with a number of them, and certainly from my vantage point of doing this kind of work, you want the parking problem first before you start addressing parking. If you're, you're putting the cart before the horse if you start talking about parking and you don't have the problem yet. Um, let's have the problem, which means we need to get business. And, and I wanted to, um, so I wanted to jump back to that point about the study that was done by Westchester University and the GIS and the leakage. And I'll, I'm going to be honest with you. And again, I've been doing this for a long time. I do not like leakage studies because they don't actually tell the whole story. And for this reason, um, you know, retailers are pretty good. They're pretty savvy at where to be, right? They have the same, they have access to the same information I do and then some. And they know where they want to be. And in particular, in this day and age, um, they locate where they believe that their, uh, you know, highest margin of, of uh, patronage will come from and certainly the most lucrative location that they can be in. That is not to say that you're not going to get retail in, you know, these areas and particularly in Coatesville. It's just to say that I never depend on leakage studies for the simple reason that most retailers are already savvy enough where they need to be. What brings retail and what, you know, uh, the old adage is rooftops attract retail. Rooftops um, precede retail. It doesn't go the other way around. So as I mentioned earlier in um, this presentation, for Coatesville specifically, getting residential close to that train station, getting enough density of that residential will in turn spawn the demand for commercial services, for retail services, which in turn makes the area that much more attractive for yet more people to want to live there, which in turn brings in yet more commercial. That is how that cycle works. It's an ecology, and that has been proven throughout the country. It, it, it does not work the other way. You do not build retail or commercial and then hope for the residential to follow. It, that's a risky strategy. And quite honestly, coming out of this pandemic, I will tell you that most lenders are going to be very stringent in terms of the criteria that they're using to make loans to retail in particular and restaurants in particular. So it is best to make sure that we have a solid demand built into the local area before we try and attract or at least you know go hog wild and trying to attract uh, commercial retail okay back to the questions um and thanks for the parking question that's a good question so steve kirshner says how much discussion was arsler involved um we uh, and todd I, and sean i don't know if you had any any connection with them or if anybody from South Coatesville wants to chime in on that, on the answer to that question. We did not specifically reach out to Arcelor. I mean, I've been involved in other projects where Arcelor is owned property in other, other places. Um, I mean, we've had conversations with the leadership of South Coatesville about their relationship with Arcelor and sort of how things go. I mean, there's no question that, um, they're the holder of the land and they have to be, you have to engage them as a partner um, and they have to be willing to be a partner um, to do some of the things that we're proposing, so. Okay. 
Uh, Chris, would there be a need for additional hotel rooms in the area? What's the status of the Marriott reopening? Any other hotels planned in close proximity? Um, I can field that one. As far as the Marriott, we have indications from their sales team that there might be a reopening in the fall, uh, but that's the extent of our knowledge um, as far as the, the Marriott. I also know that one of the proposals for the flats uh, includes the potential for an additional hotel. But again, that's that's one of the proposals that the Redevelopment Authority is is considering right now. So I don't know that there's anything, um, to my knowledge, any plans for a hotel in the area. Next question is from Teresa on Facebook. She says, Airport Road and Route 82 North need to be addressed while planning redevelopment to bring people to the area. Teresa, do you want to elaborate on that? If you're still on Facebook, let us know what you're thinking as far as um, some detail around that inquiry. Victor says, would Chevron parking, I think that's angle parking, be an alternative between certain avenues where retail is heavy if indeed there's the width um, on the street and the street allows for it, that could certainly be um, be considered. Uh, do you, Todd, Sean, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, I that, agree, if it works, <laughs> I mean, it's-, um, you know, it's that's yeah. A, yeah, that's a, that's a question for a parking expert because, you know, it is about width, it's about, you know, that, that's obviously a traffic common measure as well. Um, but I think that's beyond our, our expertise to answer that question. Yeah. Um, and then Ann Tool says, Todd, what do you believe are the most important factors that the area needs to get people to want to live here other than the train mm -hmm. station, which is obviously fantastic? Sure. Well, <clears throat> and, you know, I say, uh, and Ann, I know Ann. Um, I would say uh, the authenticity of the place, which, you know, uh, Coatesville, South Coatesville offer that in terms of their historic um, buildings. Obviously there, there's a number of buildings that are in disrepair and need, you know, some TLC and, you know, and some major upgrades. But I think in particular, that is what's going to attract people to want to come and live in Coatesville, the small town nature of it um yet you're not that far away from big city amenities it's a lower cost of living so that has you know that going for it and um also i think you know the opportunity to establish a business uh in this local area is attractive to someone who you know wants a change of pace you know maybe they're they're looking at escaping their corporate sector job or you know maybe they've recently lost their corporate sector job but they've got financial resources that would allow them to come to a Coatesville, South Coatesville area, you know, even Valley Township and establish a small business and make a go of it. I think that's what it would be attractive to someone to come and live here is, you know, um, you know, starting in a, a, a small area um, that is affordable, yet you're not so far outside of the, the metro to uh, do business or, or recreate there. All right. Well, that wraps up the questions both on Facebook and here on Zoom. I wanna thank Kevin uh, and the Chester County Planning Commission for the grant and for um, all the work that Kevin has put into this. Uh, I wanna thank Todd and Sean for, for their efforts around this uh, report. I also want to say thank you to um, all of the leadership from the three municipalities who have been engaged in this process all along and who have also made the commitment to make sure that we're implementing the report once, you know, once it's all wrapped up. Um, lastly, thank you to all of you who were interested enough to be engaged and ask questions, great questions tonight. And um, if you have any thoughts or questions or comments that you want to weigh in after we close the meeting, you are welcome to, um, to register them either on our Facebook page or come through the website at the secondcenturyalliance.org and you can communicate uh, with us through there and we'll get your answers, your questions answered. 
Uh, so thank you all for being here with us tonight. We had 32 participants on the call. We had anywhere between nine and 12 uh, viewers on Facebook. And so we really appreciate your, your interest and your engagement. And from here, have a great night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you.